This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So welcome to the uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, uh, continuing. Uh, There's an interesting debate going on in left circles uh, around the idea that uh, capitalism is no longer what it once was and that we are in a new kind of capitalism. And uh, there's a tendency in several circles to start to talk about this as the new feudalism that uh, the feudal world uh, is being resurrected. And uh, there is therefore kind of a debate uh, arising. Uh, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a strange debate because it's all about the realm of ideas and what categories we superimpose upon the world. And my own tendency is to think that I, I really don't want to get engaged in that, but I'll get engaged in it at the end of an analysis rather than at the very outset. So I don't want to say that I'm in favor of this uh, neo-feudalistic capitalism which uh, seems to be emerging because uh, uh, what we really need to do is to start with the realities which are around us and to recognize that there are certain features in that, that, that reality that need, very much need to be uh, uh, analyzed. Now, I got here a, a simple uh, data point uh, and it's about the U.S. And it says, in the U.S., the real return on equities, that is on the stock market, averaged 9.2% a year between December 1981 and December 2021. 9.2% a year growth in, in, in equities return. This far outstripped growth in average real earnings of 0.5% a year and overall GDP growth of 2.7% per year. Now, if that is the reality of the situation, it seems to me that the, the, the task of analysis is to find out wh- why is it that the return on equities averages 9.2%, whereas the growth in average real earnings is 0.5% a year. Because clearly, those people who... Uh, are invested in equities, that is the the top 1% and top 10% of the population, uh, are going to come out of this 20-year period very, very well, whereas those who are actually depending upon wages are not going to come out of it well at all, and we're going to get an enormous increase in inequality of the sort that we have seen over the last 20 years. But here, the, the key factor is... The, the, the growth in equities and the growth in the stock market. And this brings us to, the, to one of the key reasons why some people start to talk about uh, the new feudalism or the new neo-feudal capitalism. It's because when Marx was writing, industrial capitalism of the Manchester sort was really dominating the the, the British landscape. And it was generally held that there was a struggle going on between the industrial capitalists and the the remnants of of a feudal society. Uh, In fact, that struggle against the power of the landed aristocracy and the the power of the, the usurer meant that there was a struggle against the rentier. Now, the rentier is an interesting figure historically. By the rentier, we're meaning somebody who actually lives on unearned income. That is, they just sit there and get a rate of return, like the people who sit there getting a rate of return of 9.2% by investing in equities. They don't actually do anything. They can just sit in a hammock or so a wonderful uh, uh, ad, actually, for for Lloyd's Bank, uh, in which a guy is lying in a hammock 
and and he's kind of saying, you know, some days I I I recuperate, other days I speculate. And this was an ad for the for for the bank. Uh, I tried to use it in the, the condition of postmodernity, and when the Lloyd's Bank found out it was going to be in a rather critical vein, they tried to stop me, and they said they would like to to, to refuse permission to use the ad, which was so we we wrote, so the publisher and I we wrote to to them and said yes, we would uh, actually be happy to remove that ad from the condition of postmodernity, uh, and. Um, uh, in so doing, we would write across the page, there was once a, an ad for Lloyd's Bank, which stated, well, we never heard back from Lloyd's Bank again. They just left it as it was. So, so the, the, point, the, the point of this is that uh, when we start to talk about rentier incomes, we're talking about people who are just living on unearned income. And the unearned income can come from various sources. It can come from uh, the stock market. It can come from savings. When I was a kid, when I was born, actually, I was given a, a savings bank book, uh, and somebody put fifty pounds on it. And uh, over time, I put a bit more on it, and it ended up that I have about you know, when I'm twenty years old, I have um, uh, something like one hundred and fifty pounds on it. <clears throat> During that time, it's earned two or three percent compound interest. So, so, so this is unearned income. So I was beneficiary of unearned income, but not by very much. But some people lived off unearned income. And if you go to a Jane Austen novel, of course, you'll find that uh, a good match is somebody who has an income of <clears throat> rents of, uh, yeah, I don't know, £10,000 a year or £20,000 a year or whatever it is. So unearned income was a big, big issue. And when Marx was writing, there was a residual of the unearned income for uh, people living off uh, state rents. They were living, uh, you know, they were living on the, in the church. And there was, there was a whole bunch of people who were generally considered to be parasitic in relationship to the production of value. And these these people were uh, parasitic and was were, were sucking, as it were, you know, wealth. Uh, out of uh, the people who were really doing the hard work. And this, of course, was uh, both capitalists and uh, workers. And it's interesting that Saint-Simon, back in the late 18th century, uh, came up with a theory of society which differentiated between the parasitic classes, which were the church and the state and the landlords and all the rest of it, and uh, the, the, the productive classes. And the productive classes were the capitalists and the workers together. So, so there you, you have a situation in the 19th century of uh, the rentier. Uh, and the Rontier is an important figure in the 18th century and continues in the 19th century to be an important figure. But generally speaking, public policy uh, was being pushed by the industrial capitalists to make sure that the, the Rontier classes were less and less uh, significant. And also at the same time to try to define productive uses, uh, significant uses, uh, of uh, the particular forms of distribution which the productive, uh, which the non the, the, the rentiers were were were, were utilising, uh, for example, uh, taxation. Well, taxation can be used two ways by the state. It can be used to support the lifestyle of the you know the rich folk. Uh, it can be used uh, to build uh, monuments for the rich folk and uh, all the rest of it, or it can be used to try to to build uh, social housing for the poor and and and, and the like, and to take care uh, of uh, affordable housing problems and things of this of this sort. So, uh, at a certain point uh, in the nineteenth century, the whole kind of question of what the state should do what financiers should do. <clears throat> and generally speaking, the argument was that merchant capitalists had a role to play. They should help uh, the industrial capitalists sell their product. The finance capitalists had a role to play. That is, it would help the, 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 the industrial capitalists to deal with differential turnover times, long-term investments in fixed capital, all those kinds of things. Uh, and and uh, uh, the state would have productive things to do. So there was an idea of, well, there are some aspects 
of uh, uh, state incomes and, and, and state revenues and, and so on, which have productive uh, utilizations. Um, Marx tended not to call these productive in the sense that they actually created value, but he called them the necessary costs, the full, the full fray of, of a, a capitalist system, the necessary costs that needed to be taken care of. And each one of these factions, like finance capital, uh, landed capital and so on, had a, had, a, uh, had a role to play in support of uh, industrial capitalism, which was, was dominant during the period. And there was a, a political struggle also uh, amongst the economists, so that Ricardo's school was very, very strong uh, in being antagonistic to the rentier, rentier incomes. And right the way down to Keynes in the 1930s, where Keynes started to talk about that we should look forward to the day when there would be a euthanasia of the rentier, that is, a euthanasia of the, what Keynes called the coupon clippers, the people who clip coupons from, from uh, the stocks and shares and then, then sort of got their money that way. So, yes, indeed, uh, the, 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 the history of the rentier is important. And the rentier was much maligned in economic theory uh, in the, uh, by the Ricardians in the 19th century, was much maligned politically. And, and, and this was one of the things where, where you kind of said, uh, you know, we have productive ways in which these, uh, these uh, factions of capital, which actually at some point or other turn into separate classes. So we would talk about a merchant capitalist class, uh, a, a finance, finance and money capitalist class, uh, and say, well, they were, they were subservient, if you'd like, to industrial capital. So the model of capital with which uh, uh, Marx was working was essentially the model which was, uh, was there and, uh, from, from the Manchester cotton factories and industrial capitalist uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the other factors, the other forms of capital were uh, assisted, if you like, in, in the task of uh, the production of value and surplus value by helping with the circulation of capital, helping with the investment flows of, and helping with uh, the turnover times of capital and fixed capital investment and all the rest of it. So, so the, the kind of model that you would get from uh, the way Marx was writing about it, but even when Marx was writing about it, it became clear to him that some of these issues were rather more complicated. Uh, and he was particularly taken up with uh, the way in which uh, actually uh, in Second Empire Paris, the, the financial systems uh, were, were doing two things. One was they were actually channeling um, money and surplus value, sucking value out of uh, the productive sector uh, to support the lifestyles of the financiers and the bankers and all the rest of it. So that was, if you like, a, a parasitic side. But then there was the other side, which was that money which was there in the, in, in the productive sector uh, was being put together in ways which could then return into the productive sector to launch bigger and bigger projects so that probably uh, uh, the, the, the capitalists could borrow large sums of money to start to set up very large uh, conglomerate forms of uh, capitalist production. Uh, but they, to do that, they needed to have uh, uh, capital assembled and the financiers, therefore, so the financiers, therefore, have a, a sort of a dual dual character. One is positive and the other is negative. And Marx talked about the financiers in Second Empire Paris and said they had the charming character of swindler and prophet. Uh, prophet spelt uh, not like F, but P-H. That is, they were actually shape, helping to shape the future of capital by assembling uh, massive amounts of money for reinvestment, and that that reinvestment was then kind of reshaping the, the circulation of capital. So they played a, a constructive role in relationship uh, to, to to capital accumulation, uh, and but they also played a parasitic and swindler role, and therefore they were engaging in speculation and and doing all kinds of uh, uh, things of, the, of that sort. But in Second Empire Paris, the the the, the city was rebuilt essentially on borrowed money. 
and the money was borrowed by the builders and the construction agents and all the rest of it. And they built the new boulevards, they built the new train systems, they built, you know, there was, in other words, the, the, the financiers were, were, were engaging in a lot of, of, of very, very important uh, 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 investments uh, in the built environment and the like. So the rebuilding of Paris, and which brought full employment and brought all kinds of new lifestyles into being and so on. So this is why Marx talks about them as a, a prophet of the future, because they are actually creating the future world through the, the nature of their investments. And the problem was that they not only were doing that, but they were also swindling everybody and, and, and gaining immense well-being from themselves at the same time as they were pretending that somehow or other they were... Um, being very ascetic and not not consuming because uh, uh, they had this theory of uh, uh, I don't know exactly what, what we would call it. It was kind of uh, you know abstinence uh, that they were uh, abstaining uh, to make these big investments. And Marx has a funny kind of line about that. He says, you know. They, they, they so much emphasize abstinence, you expect to go see them sort of uh, almost begging on the pavement because they, they haven't done any of the uh, any investment for themselves. So the, the, even during Marx's period, as he gets into volume three of Capital and he starts to talk about uh, the financial classes and what the financial classes do and how important they are for the circulation and uh, capital and the reinvestment of capital, how they play that constructive role in relationship to production, but they also play this non-constructive and parasitic role. And, and, and this, this, was, this was something that Marx was already sort of onto. And, and he was recognizing that you, you had to have financiers. It wasn't just simply a, a parasitic thing entirely. You had to have financiers because capital couldn't function without them. So and this is one of the things that Marx is very concerned about, is to say, well, why is it that you need uh, to assemble capital in the way you do uh, in order to gain an investment? And this is, of course, what's, why, why the stock market becomes important. So the creation of the stock market was one of the ways in which people could invest in the future. And this is where the major returns come from. And so the creation of the future, it also becomes a speculative act. And, and so speculation. So Marx, is, Marx gets some of this right and, 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 and starts to, to, to recognize that even in his time, this sort of thing was going, was, was, was going on and it needed to be understood and it needed to be analyzed. And he had to recognize that there were certain social relations going on between, uh, between finance capitalists and industrial capitalists. And he pointed out that the relationship between, between them almost rendered what the, the, the worker was doing irrelevant. So there was a kind of, if you like, a factional fight going on between with the industrial capitalists and the finance capitalists. The same thing would be true of the merchant capitalists. Marx at that time was mainly going to say that the finance capitalists and the merchant capitalists are subservient to India's industrial capital, and they are the servants uh, of industrial capitalism. Uh, but what this statement suggests is that since 1980, one of the things that's happened is that that relationship has, has, has been inverted. That, in fact, what we've seen since the 1980s is that because of the neoliberal way in which the neoliberal door was opened, uh, to all kinds of uh, financial uh, uh, work, you know, financial operations and, and so on, is that uh, we, f we find a situation in which, more often than not, finance capital becomes the master, not the servant. And it is even the case that in certain situations, merchant capital becomes the master. Uh, consider, for example, the big merchant capitalist firms which have grown up very, very strongly since 1980. Walmart, Ikea, and the like, they all are actually selling things and they're merchant capitalist firms, and they actually uh, uh, can put pressure on industrial capital. In other words, it's no longer a situation where the industrial capitalists uh, are kind of t telling the, the merchant capitalists, you know, the, telling the conditions of sale to the merchant capitalists. The merchant capitalists are actually ordering things from the, the, the industrial capitalists 
and are paying the industrial capitalist as little as they need to in order to maximize their own profits and the same. So, so what you find is, is, is something which uh, is called monopsony. Monopsony is a situation where you have one consumer and the one consumer can dictate conditions to multiple producers. Now, in a way, uh, you know, it's not the case with Walmart that there's only one consumer. Uh, but Walmart is one very, very large consumer and it certainly dictates uh, prices and dictates qualities and dictates quantities and all the rest of it to its suppliers. And its suppliers are essentially doing the behest of, of Walmart. And the same would be true of Ikea and the same is true even in many of the textile companies. And if you go to the sort of organizations like the, the big uh, merchant uh, capitalists, in, in the textile industry, uh, the Gap and Banana Republic and all the rest of it, you'll find that they're the ones who are dictating terms uh, to the industrialists. So there's been a switch. And Marx did not anticipate that. And as there is a switch, uh, this means that the power center of capital shifts from industrial capitalism to merchant capitalism in many instances, and depending upon the sector, or to finance capitalism. And, and if finance, the, the, so these forms of capital become much stronger and much more dominant. And because they become much more dominant, they are not necessarily concerned so much with the production of surplus value. They, 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 the production of surplus value is, is sort of a, a collateral thing as far as they're concerned. If, they, if, for example, financiers can earn more money by speculating in art or speculating in property rights in in uh, oil wells, or separate or, or property rights in land. If 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 you can get a higher rate of return from doing that than you can from investing in steel production, then you don't bother to invest in steel production, and you don't bother to invest in production in the ordinary sense of the, of the term at all. You start to invest in weird forms of production. Uh, particularly the production of spectacle and so on. So the financiers right now are heavily into, uh, you know, sponsoring uh, soccer leagues and and soccer clubs and all the rest of it who are, play, you know, playing multi-million pound salaries to, to their players, uh, having fantastic kind of television contracts and, and so on. So that, 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 that this is the sort of thing that, 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 that has been going on since the, since the 1980s. So there's been, a, if you like, a switch. Now, when I say there's been a switch, it depends upon the nature of the sector. There are some sectors where monopsony power has become very significant. Monopsony power in relationship to agriculture, for example. Uh, you have a, 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 a multinational like McLean's. McCain, McCain's, I think it is, from, from Canada, that does all, all the frozen French fries. And what they do is they simply go out and they kind of uh, find farmers and they contract with farmers to pr produce the, the, the potatoes. They give the farmers the seed. Uh, the farmers plant the seed and uh, then uh, the McCain's sends in enough and, and takes what, what it wants from in the way of potatoes. Whatever is left over is left over for the, for the farmer and the farmer can go sell it separately. So this is a this is this is this is a this is contract farming and and most farming now and all of those cans you see cans of peas cans of beans cans of this you know goya and so on they 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 essentially have uh, monopsony power in relationship uh, to to all of the agriculturalists who are producing uh, the, the the potatoes and the, the the peas and the beans and the and the tomatoes and so on so. So what you have is, is a very different situation from the situation where Marx was, talk, was talking about, where value being produced on the land was actually being produced by the farmer and done in such a way that the farmer would then sell it. But now the farmer is actually doing it on contract. And, and, and in a sense, the farmer has become an indentured worker for, for the canning companies. And the same is true in... Uh, textiles, for example. In some other areas, however, the producers still have a certain amount of power. In automobiles, for example, the auto companies are the big, big companies. 
are, are, are the producers, uh, uh, they, 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 they still maintain a, a, a good deal of power, although they still need to have a, 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 a sort of marketing organization like General Motors has General Motors Acceptance Corporation, which uh, in a sense uh, financed the purchase of automobiles. So you've, 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 you've got uh, General Motors producing the automobiles and you've got General Motors Acceptance Company, which is financing their purchase. Uh, General Motors Acceptance Company became so large that uh, when the crisis struck in 2008, what do you find? You find immediately the money that is needed to, to, to buy the, the commodity is going to have to come from General Motors Acceptance Corporation. These are the sorts of arrangements which now have come up. Now, why would we want to say that this is a new form of capitalism? For me, I've always thought of capitalism as being something that's all fluid, something that's always in motion, something that can be best thought of as a totality and understood as a totality, which is in constant evolution. Therefore, the form of capital today is going to be very different from the one which existed in the 1960s, which is very different from the one in the 1930s, different from. So it's not as if, I'm kind of saying, once upon a time there was capital and now it's evolved into something else. No, I'm, I'm saying my way of thinking about it is to say, that actually there's a whole history of evolutionary structure within capital. It's constantly growing. It's constantly morphing into something different. It's very fluid. The, the class relations within it are shifting. The balance of forces within it are constantly shifting. The power of the state in relationship to what is going on, the power of, of finance, the power of the merchants, the power of the landed aristocrats and so on, those are all you know, shifting. And, and, and that therefore, I would kind of say that capital is therefore uh, a system in evolution. And as it evolves, so it is transformed and the, 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 the class relations and internally and, and the class relation between all forms of capital and labor and the class relation and the form of the state and all those kinds of things are constantly evolving. And that therefore, I would not, not want to say that it is going back to something called feudalism. It's not, no. But on the other hand, it is going forward into something that is rather different. And that something which is rather different is indeed uh, a situation in which the finance side of it has become very, very, very dominant. Now, if finance becomes dominant, then he says you're dealing with a form of capital, which is very special. And here, I think, what we recognize is that, the, the, that money capital is the only form of capital that can, can increase without limit. And here, too, this whole business of, you know, falling rate and rising mass, there's a rising mass of output, but there's a certain mass in terms of uh, actual things which, which is difficult to, to supersede. But that's not true of money. So what we've started to find is that the money side of things is becoming more and more d detached, as it were, from, from the rest. And that we are therefore finding uh, a monetized form of capital which is becoming more and more significant. And one of the things that that says is that actually uh, profit making is no longer going to be confined to, to, to parallels with surplus value production. No, profit making is going to become something which is about financial operations in and of themselves. And that profit making, which can come from, uh, say, uh, housing development, is, 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 is going to be sort of caught up in a, cold, in a, in a, in a closed circle. That the, the production of housing can be financed by a developer at the same time, the purchase of the housing can be sold, but can be financed. So the financier, in fact, is going to operate both in terms of supply and demand. Now, this business of having supply and demand dominated by capital is not unusual in capitalism. In fact, Marx talks about this and says that's the problem with labor. Everyone likes to think that the labor is actually, you know, is, you know the supply and demand for labor. Is, 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 is like between two autonomous and independent uh, uh, factors of production. And Marx points out in capital it's not, because capital can produce surplus labor by technological innovation, 
Capital can also do it by mobilizing the Industrial Reserve Army. So that, as Marx says, capital operates on both the supply and the demand for labor. So actually what appears to be in, 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 in capitalist economics, a sort of independent, autonomous factors of production which are brought in collision with each other, no Marx is saying capital controls both the supply and the demand for labor. It also supplies both the demand for housing at the same time as it, 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 it orchestrates the, the supply of housing. So the fact that capital can operate on both sides is not an unusual feature for a capitalist mode of production. And that to the degree that it does so, it produces some peculiarities within the capitalist mode of production, which actually become rather crisis-prone. And this takes me back also to the kind of crisis tendencies that, that arose in 2007, 2008. And one of the things that I, I had said in, 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 in the, the new imperialism was that there was a phenomenon uh, uh, going on, which was accumulation by dispossession. And this accumulation by dispossession uh, was just as important as actually the production of surplus value, because basically... The, the way in which uh, capital was uh, evolving uh, during the 1980s and 90s and so on was a situation in which the balance of power between finance capital and industrial capital and merchant capital and, and all the rest of it was shifting and that therefore there were different sets of possibilities available uh, for capital to, to engage in profitable activities. And one of those maids was this sort of business of accumulation by dispossession. Now, in this argument about the new feudalism, uh, accumulation by dispossession gets a little bit mixed up in it. Many people start to cite it as, a well, this is just a just primitive accumulation, which was what got us out of feudalism, and, it's, and it's, that's all it is. But no, my answer is accumulation by dispossession it has, has a particular kind of history, and we therefore need to take account uh, of, of how this works and, and, and how this then leads to uh, actually the capacity of uh, large segments of capital to operate in such a way that while they don't entirely, uh, while I would not say their activities are not entirely unearned and, and, and so on, they, they are very only slightly involved. Let me give you just by way of... Uh, conclusion, uh, uh, an extended example of this. In 2007, 2008, we had the, the crisis, and the crisis was in the housing sector. And as we know, uh, you know, seven or eight million households lost their houses to foreclosure. Uh, their houses were a certain value. Uh, even if they thought they could sell them and get some equity, the housing market collapsed so they couldn't sell them. And if they could sell them, the, the price was so low that it wasn't worth it. So you found many people just walked out of their houses and left the keys. In other instances, some people who had been paying their rent or paying, paying their mortgage regularly were, uh, were illegally foreclosed upon. So a, a huge foreclosure takes place, Okay. So there's, there's, there's seven or eight million houses out there. Which, 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 where are they? Well, they're all in, in the hands of the banks. The banks have foreclosed on them, so, so they're all held by the banks. Now, some of the banks held so many houses, and the houses were worth so little in the middle of the crisis that the banks were themselves in a lot of trouble. And so some of the banks had to file for bankruptcy because they, they, they had this dead weight of all of these houses which were worthless uh, in, in their portfolio. But let's take the case where, where actually the banks uh, had them uh, and didn't, didn't, didn't file for bankruptcy. So the banks are sitting there with all of these, these houses, which are worth very little, uh, even though the, the nominal value, uh, which had been there before the crisis, was still sort of stated on the books, but it was unrealizable. So along comes an organ, a, 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 a hedge fund, no, no, a private equity company, Blackstone, and it says to the banks, okay, we will, we will, take, we will take those uh, housing off your hands for, for a dis at a discounted price. And, and to do this, they need to borrow a lot of money. So they borrow a lot of money from institutions, from uh, insurance companies, from, from uh, finance capitalists and all the rest of it. So Blackstone borrows a lot of money and goes to a bank and says, okay, 
we have the money now. We can we can give you uh, the value of the housing, uh, which is uh, say thirty percent of its market value. So we get the housing for thirty percent of its market value, and we take it off your hands. And the banks say thank you very much. We really really are very appreciative of that. We've got thirty percent. But then the state comes in and says to the bank, "Well, okay, we will make up the difference between what you paid." To, to Blackstone's um, and 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 uh, or what well, what Blackstone paid to you and what the nominal value would have been. So if Blackstone paid thirty percent, we'll pay seventy percent. So the banks actually were bailed out because they got thirty percent from Blackstone and and seventy percent from from the federal government. So they eventually got the full value of the house, and and, and the banks survived. Now some of the banks that filed for bankruptcy. Uh, when they, when this was found out, people went in and sort of took over the bank and then did this game and got all this money from the federal government to 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 to, to come back. So the banks came out of this fine. What did Blackstone do? Blackstone's sitting there now with a big uh, you know, mass of housing. He starts to turn it into rental housing, and it does extremely well. Uh, people got to live somewhere, and, and, and given that they would only pay 30% or 40% or whatever it was of the housing value, it could make, make out and get most of the money back uh, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's paid to, to the bank uh, in a very short period of time. This is, this is, this is, this is uh, in effect, effect, a transfer of wealth from the original owner, homeowners uh, to, uh, eventually, to Blackstone, uh, and and then that transfer is upended by is, is, with, with the federal government bringing in uh, a lot of uh, a lot more support. So Blackstone then becomes one of the biggest companies in the world. It becomes the biggest landlord in the United States. It has a huge portfolio. becomes hugely hugely profitable. And, and and now it's it's I don't know it's investing in all kinds of things. It's it's got uh, it's taking over. Uh, Sort of uh, industrial parks in China, industrial parks in uh, Australia. It's done done housing and, and 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 rental housing and all the rest of it. It does all of these things. Uh, are absolutely, kind of astonishing. And and and, and Schwartzman, the, the 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 CEO of the thing, becomes one of the richest people in the world, and gives a huge amount of money to. Uh, Oxford University and MIT to play, you know, to uh, uh, teach the humanities better, and at the same time, Schwartzman is a great supporter of Donald Trump, and 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 it has uh, it joins with some several of the other mega. So he's part of the oligarchy. So you get an oligarchy that forms, and it's done by these financial games, where you know Blackstone. Gets the get borrowed, pays back the borrowed money to whoever they lent it to, and they they now got all this equity in, in housing worldwide. And the the value of the company is now, I don't know. I've like, I should go out and check what it what is what its stock market value is now, but it's it's certainly up there in the trillion dollars or more uh, by now. And this is the sorts of things that people do, and you see this with uh, you know Elon Musk, and you see this with with his attempt to take over a trip. Twitter and 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 he again he wasn't necessarily taking it over with his own money. He went somewhere and said, "Lend me twenty five billion dollars, or, or whatever it was, and I'll you know twenty five trillion dollars or whatever it was that he's that he's that he's paying for it." And so so you know the rich rich folk can 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 get it. So we're living in a society where those kinds of things are going on, and that is the evolution that has come about. And it has come about in part for one very simple reason, that money is the only form of capital that knows no limit. And money is not actually under the control of anybody. Money is created by, by people engaging in trade and gave, engaging in exchange. So you make the money, in a sense, you make the money as you go along. All the Federal Reserve can do is to sort of check on the money that's been made and try to make sure it's qualitatively okay, and it can support creating more money by quantitative easing and uh, and, and and the like. So here you have a situation where I don't think this is a uh, that, that, that we should be talking about a new feudalism. Uh, 
It's certainly a new form of capitalism. I think the two areas which I uh, mentioned, which are, are, are uh, defining for the new form of capitalism, uh, are one with this financial side and the other is the artificial intelligence side and what is going on with the creation of these new platforms uh, and, uh, and what's going on with uh, the fangs, uh, uh, the, the apples and the, uh, and the Googles and the, uh, and, and the Amazons and so on. So we've, we've, got, a, we've, we've got a new kind of, of, of capitalism and a new kind of capitalism, however, which is, which is evolving. And it is evolving for certain reasons in certain kinds of directions. And the big problem, I think, for us is then how do we start to be anti-capitalist towards this kind of capitalism? In other words, being anti-capitalist to, to when, when Marx was, was writing was, you know, I won't say it was simple, but at, at least it was clear who the enemy was and, and, and where the enemy was and what, what, what should be done about it. So, I, you know, you, you could organize a strike against General Motors or whatever in the 1930s, and so you have these kinds of things. Right now, uh, those are the things that are very difficult to organize. And so we've got these massive, massive uh, companies which are uh, out there and, and how the artificial intelligence and, and, and that is going to work is, is an open question. But one of the other big things is this, is this increasing uh, uh, quantity of, of finance capital, which I think is extremely dangerous in the sense that it seems to me that the whole world is really operating on one large Ponzi scheme because in a sense what happens is that for every phase of, of or increase in the debt and increase in, in finance and the rest of it, you get in a phase of, of increase of, uh, uh, of uh, species. And as a result of that, you're, you're, you're flooding the world with, with, the, with amounts of money and, 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 and oligarchic uh, possibilities in ways which I think are um, really, really dangerous uh, for, for the future. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.